Good evening. I'm Dominic Riley. I'm chair of the Sports and Leisure Forum for the Cambridge University Land Society. Welcome to our third in our series of In Conversation with Gatherings. Tonight's webinar follows on from previous conversations with Mike Brearley, former England cricket captain, and Sarah Winkless, three-time rowing Olympian. Before we introduce Monty Don and start the conversation, can I introduce our two interviewers, Tanya Bird and Mike Gunton. Tanya and Mike are graduates of Cambridge University and friends of our treasurer, Eric Ruan, whom they met during their time as student at Keyes College and who have remained close friends ever since. So let me first of all introduce Tanya. Tanya's interest in plants and the natural world grew from both her parents, who were passionate gardeners, and from her family holidays in Scotland and Wales. Her interest was also encouraged by a Mr Bowley, her biology teacher at school, who also was coincidentally Mike's biology teacher. Arriving at Keyes to study natural sciences, Tanya crossed paths with Mike again, who was by then doing a PhD. After Cambridge, Tanya embarked on a commercial career, often using her scientific background. Following periods in marketing, patent agency, fund management and fundraising, she then found the perfect match for her skills in running the commercial arm of the Natural History Museum. She is most proud of increasing accessibility to the museum's astonishing collections, including the fundraising and planning for the Darwin Centre. Tanya was then appointed a trustee of Kew Gardens and chairman of Kew Enterprises and helped to consider the future strategy and role of the Botanic Garden and develop their fundraising, which has enabled many developments, including the renovation of the Temperate House. Tanya then embarked on an MBA at Oxford, making the boat race a win-win for her. She is now a director of a strategic advisory firm and continues to look for ways she can utilise her experience to the benefit of the natural world, whilst keeping time for her passion, which is, of course, gardening. Our second interviewer is Mike Gunton. Mike is the creative director of the BBC Natural History Unit. He is a BAFTA and Emmy Awards winner. He has been a wildlife filmmaker for over 30 years. He has been executive producer of numerous acclaimed documentary series, many in collaboration with Sir David Attenborough including Planet Earth 2, Dynasties, Africa and Life. As well as being inspired by the same Mr Bowley in learning biology, he hails from a long line of botanists, horticulturalists and gardeners. His grandfather was a nurseryman and seedsman, his father and sister both lecturers in horticulture. By his own admission, Mike has rather let the side down by being a zoologist, having previously mentioned his PAD, PhD, which he studied whilst at Cambridge, but he does now do his best to try not to kill all the plants in his own garden. His latest project for the BBC is a kind of planet earth for plants, called The Green Planet, working again with Sir David Attenborough, and which is due to air next year. Although there are plenty of exotic locations, Mike has made sure that gardens have their place in the programme too, including shooting last year at the Cambridge University Botanical Gardens. So over to you, Mike and Tanya, to introduce our guest, Monty Don, and start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's uh, slightly weird for us because we can't see any of you, but we understand there are many of you out there. So I say thank you and for coming and welcome from all of us. And um, it's a slightly strange thing to introduce Don, um, Monty, but there he is, and we're looking forward to speaking to, to him in a moment. Um, just one last thing to say is, as I said, Tanya and I have known each other for nearly 40 years, so we never thought when we first knew each other at school that we'd ever be doing this together, but we're very much looking forward to it. Um, so I think we we'll kick off straight away, Monty, if you don't mind, by now we're sort of assuming that most of the people who are on this will have at least something in common, in a, an interest in the natural world and an interest in in the, in the world of the garden. But one thing they definitely have in common is that they were we were all at Cambridge. So we thought we might start by asking you um, about your time at Cambridge. I mean, was it fun? Did you, when you were there, I know you were reading English. Did you think to yourself that as you were reading Chaucer or whatever it was, that one day you would be, have taken this path? Did you, you know, when you were wandering off in the evening, did you find yourself in the 
in the botanic gardens thinking, yes, this is the life for me? Or Absolutely was it <laughs> no, no, uh, It was never on my mind. I mean, I, I had grown up in a household where I gardened and we all gardened. And uh, by the time I went to Cambridge, um, I had worked as a gardener and I was, uh, I was a gardener. I mean, that's what I did, but it was, a, it was very much a private passion. It was, I didn't connect it at all at that stage with any sort of sense of a career or, 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 or I, I was reading English because I loved literature and it was as simple as that because I just wanted to, to read and I wanted to write. And on one level, that's never changed. It took me a long time. I'm into my thirties before I could realize that I could combine these two things. Um, and it, I mean, it, I would have been 32, 33 before there was this little light bulb went on my head and I thought I can write about gardening and I could share that. I could share this private thing uh, with other people. And I've, you know, I've done that ever since. But at Cambridge, no, I, I certainly walked. I love the college gardens, um, the fellows gardens. And, and I used to visit them as much as I could. I worked as a gardener. I had, a, there was a garden I used to go and work in. I mean, very, no, not at all elevated stuff. It was mowing and digging and, and sort of growing vegetables and cutting hedges, that sort of thing. And then they had a friend who I went and did the same thing for, um, simply to, to earn some money, you know. And then in the holidays, I always worked <laughs> and, and, and worked very often in gardens. So that there were these two quite separate paths at that time in my life. But I mean, I, I look back at Cambridge with huge fondness but I don't think it was fun. I think it was too anxious for that. I mean, I, mm. I think I was happy. I was, I was incredibly engaged and, and, and aware of that. I was overwhelmed by the sense of privilege actually, all the time. I never lost that. And, you know, the architecture, the gardens, the, the, the people, the opportunities, even on a banal level like sport, to, to go and be able to do those things so easily and immediately. Um, yes, I, it's one of the remarkable people you meet is the thing that... Yeah, it was. Happens. I mean, I think with hindsight, I didn't meet enough remarkable people. I spent too much time in my room reading. <laughs> I did a lot of reading. <laughs> and I always had a dog at Cambridge all the time I was there. That's very maudlin. It, well, I, I, I didn't know at the time, but I, I didn't. And so I used to always take her for a walk in the morning. And I kept chickens too. In Thompson's Lane, in the in the outside loo in Thompson's Lane, I kept them. Um, so you know, it was, it, yeah, <laughs> it was, and there was a sense. I think it was looking back. If you were at Cambridge in the seventies, it was probably the last period when it was a completely um, irresponsible time in terms. Of one never thought about money. I never thought about money or work or career or anything like that never had any money you know it didn't I didn't know anyone who had money um it, there was no there didn't seem to be that pressure there was lots of academic pressure and, and all the other kind of things that young people have but money wasn't one of them um, yeah. uh, well, we were all I think enormously again privileged to have that experience and the quality of education and the and the surroundings I mean the, the architecture and as you say the gardens um, and we were just sort of chatting a little bit earlier about, you know, the world has changed so much in so many different ways, um, because it was rather a long time ago that we were all, all in Cambridge. So really what I'm interested to hear about, Monty, is, um, you know, the, the things that would preoccupy the world at the moment. I mean, climate change is clearly, you know, very big on, you know, on the agenda. And COVID now we've got that. Um, this, they both seem to me to drive into the whole notion that we as humankind need to change our relationship with the natural world. So, I mean, that is, I think, just, you know, irrefutable. And I think my question to you is really, well, where do gardens come into this? You know, what role can gardens play in, in that changing appreciation that we have in the, our engagement and, and how we respect and, and work alongside and together with the natural world? So that's one of the things that I'm interested I think, I mean, I think it's an incredibly interesting question. And I think it's, it's completely pertinent because what's become apparent over the last few years to me is that, that gardens and gardeners are right on the front line. Mm -hmm. We're right at the cutting edge of this. And I mean, it's very interesting with, with you and Mike there is that a lot of, of our perception of, of this 
the natural world. Uh, and you know this terrible expression that people use of being in nature um, is at arm's length and or has been at arm's length and that's partly the fault of people like Mike to because these programs that are made are so good and people it, they are so rich that it 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 fulfills all our sort of needs and expectations to of of the natural world and we we can travel the whole globe uh, at via a screen and at, at second hand and I think to some extent, we had lost this awareness that, that climate change, the environment, the natural world, all the creatures are right on our doorstep. They are around us, wherever we are. You know, whether you live in a flat, the sky through your window is absolutely as pertinent as the rainforest or, or, or the snow leopards in the Himalayas or whatever. And I think that what's happened particularly in the last year through lockdown, but it's been evolving uh, over the last five years or so, is that people have been forced to pay attention to the, their world, however ordinary it might have previously seemed. And they've realized that it has the potential to be extraordinary. And the magic of watching a frog or a robin or um, you know, a worm, for goodness sake, anything, and, and realizing that that connects directly to everything else, and that what that's done, apart from, from open doors to people, in a way that, I mean, in my work with Gardener's World, and we are receiving so much feedback on that level, but also to realize that if they want to engage, if you want to deal with the rainforest or, or the ice caps or whatever, the best place to start is at home. Work out from where you are rather than, than seeing it as a sort of metaphoric Greenpeace boat going out to rescue the ice cap. And that's too big a leap. What, what I find exciting and, and incredibly um, sort of rewarding is that people are saying, no, I can engage with this from my window, from, my, from the little patch of soil I have, from my allotment or, or and so on and so forth. So I think that's happening. Oh, well, that's, yeah, really great. And I think certainly from, you know, I've always been an advocate for plants, you know, being a mm. plant mm. person. And, and, you know, I think, as you were saying, I think for a long time, you know, whether it was Mike's fault or anybody else's, that those sort of large charismatic animals took front, to front stage and you had to go and save them. And really that whole notion about the whole web of life that supports mm. those mm. animals and themselves. So that's great. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a big leap. You, it, it's a big ask for people to, and this is the first time in history really it's ever been an issue where people are being asked to connect their own lives and, and which can be, you know, we all live parochial lives to a greater or lesser extent with the whole world and, and, and you know, the coral reef of, of Australia or the ice cap or, or, or whatever it might be. That, that's asking a lot. And, and so building those bridges and those, that, that web of connection is, is a major task, I think. And is, is that bridge built by the actual contact with the soil, the seedling, and actually that sort of taking it down, getting your horizons down to a very small level where you've nurtured a seed, you've pricked it out, you've planted it and you see it grow. And because you're so connected with it, you care about it in a different way and then extrapolate it. So is it the sort of, do you think it's that experience that actually the doing of the gardening and getting really close in the sense of really putting your hands in the earth that makes that connection something that you can fight for more than just some notion that you're being told about that you must do. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I mean, from, from my own point of view, it's completely visceral, mm -hmm. you know, that, that physical contact with the soil to me is, is the beginning, the alpha and the omega of, of gardening. And that is what it's all about. And, and whether you are growing um, lettuce or rare plants that, that, you know, there are only four <laughs> in, in the world, it's the same thing. It's, and so I think that if you can empower people that 
to, to connect with the earth and the very fact that we use the same word for soil as we do for the planet, it's significant. And, and that there is this earth that they tend and they nurture and they care about and it, they, it's domestic and it's part of their life and it's subjective and it's possessive is the rather abstract, big, grand idea, then you're a long way down the road to, to enabling them to, to connect those things and do something about it. Um, and I think that, that what's happened in the last year with lockdown is particularly in the spring, because we had this beautiful spring, it was exquisite last spring. And that was, a so people forced to be in their garden, many people for the first time ever to sit and watch with this glorious weather, um, the simple ordinary things, it became alive in a way that, that was transformative, I think. And, and then they could start doing, they could start making and planting and, and trying it out and children could do it and they shared it and, and the failures. And, and we all know that, that gardening is actually not about measuring success, it's about process, you know, and, and this idea that, that it's something you, you never master. Um, mm. Whereas I think one of the great faults of British gardening, uh, over, particularly in the 20th century, and you know, there are good historical reasons for it, is this idea that it's a series of exams you have to pass to get to the next stage. Uh, and, and that you, you, know, you, you get acknowledged by your peers as, as, as reaching certain levels. And that's partly to do with the hierarchical system of how professional gardeners work. It's partly to do with, with the existing exams you have, the RHS exams and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, if you have a profession, people want validation. They want to pass exams. They want to have letters after their name and why not? But I certainly, from where I am, I want people to feel completely free to go out and, and make mistakes, you know, do simple things and get the same pleasure from it and the richness from it. And I think that that, that then frees out into the bigger world. One of the things that you I mentioned about observation, I just wanted to quickly pick mm. up on that because the, the value of observation, of sit, just sitting and watching nature and um, sometimes recording it and sometimes trying to understand it, uh, that that seemed to me always be has been historically a kind of the foundation of a lot of of our science, natural sciences, and it does seem to be it's slightly dropped off the curriculum now. You know, to, the sort of natural history side of science seems to have gone a bit. How how important do you think that is to to encourage? Because not only that that side, but in terms of its impact on your own sense of well being, on your own sense of of comfort. I mean, I think that's one of the things that people have noticed, you, you mentioned it, that they've noticed, that perhaps without realising it, I feel slightly happier if I can see that, you know, this idea that the natural health service, the greenery yeah. around us actually does improve our, our well-being and our, our well, physical and mental well-being. One of the um, big issues that, that is involved in gardening is, is, is mental health of all kinds, both on a, on a sort of specific level of using it as part of treating people who have mental illness of some kind and also of maintaining well-being and of just the sense, as you say, of just feeling better. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of, of, of uh, banding about of, of awareness and, and, and mindfulness and all that sort of thing, but it's just paying attention. It's just being there. And as you say, stopping and looking. I remember talking to um, somebody in the Natural History Unit, Julian Hector, who may know, who's there. And we were talking about seeing birds, because I, I like birds very much and watch them. He said, yes, but to see birds, you have to look. They don't just crop into your life. You actually have to just open your eyes and look for them, and then you might start to see them. And I think that that's something that in modern life doesn't encourage. You know, it's, I always just feel I live in the countryside and I'm cut off and I hardly ever see anyone. And I go, so when I go blinking into the big city, the first thing I notice is that no, everybody is scurrying along with headphones on and they're looking at their phone and they're, they're not noticing anything at all. Mm -hmm. And just to have people stop and notice what's around and look at it and then cu be curious about it. Mm -hmm. um, is really enriching at lots and lots of levels, both in your knowledge about the natural world, 
but also yourself. It slows things down. It, this sense that, that life, you know, by the time you reach a certain age, inevitably lots of things have happened to you, but it's all you've got. The, the present moment is all that there is. Mm. And that to somehow gloss over that or minimize that is throwing it away. And that the, the quiet observation can be as rich and as rewarding as the profound moment or the, the, the big highlight in your life, which as we all know, tends to sort of happen at the corner of your eye anyway. Um, so I hope, and well, I believe that gardening is very, very effective at, at pressing that button, at, at being the trigger that can make that happen. That however complicated and difficult and stressful life can be, that if you go outside and you start to, you know, prick out some seedlings or do a bit of pruning or just do a bit of weeding, you become focused on the job in hand, but without stress. And it's very powerful. And in terms of the, the ability of gardens to draw nature beyond the garden that you've created, you know, they're as a magnet for other life. Mm. And because I, I, th- I know you've written at times about the, the joy of, un- of, by observation, understanding something, you know, making a discovery for yourself the first time by yeah. working out what's going on. Yeah. How, how, much of a, how, how much time do you get to do that? And how important is that in your, in your thinking? Well, I mean, <laughs> like, like I imagine you or anyone else, I spend most of my time either writing or, or in meetings or, or sort of sorting out problems rather than, than gardening. Um, or I'm filming gardening or writing about gardening. So it, it's those moments are when I'm not, I'm doing it entirely for the, its sake rather than performance of any kind or, or research. The best research is usually done when you're not researching, you know, when you're, when you're just doing it and then these moments come. But yeah, I, I spend as much time as I can under whatever circumstances outside. Um, I mean, I'm lucky I have a garden, I also have a farm. Um, just quietly doing things on my own um, and very, very aware of what's around me. Um, And like everybody else, if I don't know something, I scurry away and try and find out, you know, and and, uh, it's one constant process of of discovery. But I'm not a trained naturalist. I'm not a trained botanist, you know, so all the time I'm learning. Well, that in itself is, I think is a great pleasure. Yeah. And I've, another thing I'm, I'm particularly interested in is the gardens I've had, I've always inherited and I've never sort of gone sort of ground zero and stripped them bare and started again. But mm. um, in reading about the creation of your garden, I gather you all, you sketched it out and you had it all in your head before you planted anything so I'm really interested in another aspect of gardening as well which is the creative process you know the balance between um, what you're trying to achieve with the garden I mean gardens have always had lots of purposes they've either you know been quite functional as a kitchen garden or they're there just to delight us or they're there to create a peaceful haven in a busy urban environment or show off your wealth if you've got some grand you know fancy garden so in amongst all these things, when you're creating your gardens, what's been your motivation? Has it been a certain philosophy, a certain sense of style that you're looking for? Is it, has it evolved over a period of time? How do you go about your designing and creating a garden? Oh, and is it similar to other creative processes like writing? Because you're obviously, you know, you are a gardener, but you're obviously a highly creative person, first and foremost, whether it's, you know, jewellery, writing, gardening. Well, I think uh, I'm beginning to realise now that my motives were not transparent. In other words, what I thought I was doing Mm -hmm. was probably not what I was doing. So that, that when I made this garden, and we began, I began the work, began drawing in 1991, 92, but I didn't start planting till 1993. So there was a long period wow. um, of spending time in it. I, you know, I always say to people, the most important thing when you get a garden is where does the sun rise every day of the year? Where does it set? What's the east wind like? You know, what's the, you need to know these things. What, and I, I just spent a lot of time just looking at it and, and thinking about it and drawing 
and, and drawing out plans. But in fact, what I now realize is the particular circumstance in my life, we'd had this jewelry business and, and it didn't go bankrupt, but we certainly got to rocky times and we had to sell it and we had to sell our house and our, basically everything we had to, to sort it out. So my life was, was slightly in free fall and I had three small children and I didn't have enough work and it, it, you know, it was difficult, really difficult. So I was ordering my life in the garden. I was rescuing my life. It, by, by creating this ordered space that I could control. And I was enormously physical about it. I mean, I've always been quite physical, but, but I threw myself into it and I dug everything. You know, I was, I was absolutely a double digger and uh, you know, none of this, no dig nonsense. I, I, wanted to work, I wanted to work as hard as it was possible. You know, if my hands weren't bleeding, I hadn't worked hard enough. And almost literally, I believe that. And so there was a kind of, a complicated process of rescuing the things that were going wrong by creating somewhere that was ordered and beautiful and would grow and would last and not be taken away. Um, and also feeling that if I really worked, if I gave everything, then it could come good. I could do it, you know, I would overcome it. Now, I don't think that's a particularly good way to garden. You know, <laughs> I don't think that I wouldn't advise anyone else to do that. It was slightly bonkers. But that's what I think happened. And so the, this garden, for example, has a lot of straight lines in it. And I think that's why, and, and it's, I mean, it's an awkward site. The house is in a corner of the bit of land. So you've got a house literally tucked in one corner and then two acres jagging off at right angles from it. So you, you know, I had to work out how to get yourself out and then out into the garden. And also it was a very exposed site. So there were lots of practical considerations. I wanted a series of smaller spaces that would have little microclimates and would be protected. Um, I also had very, very limited budget. I mean, practically no money. So that was another consideration. So that there were, there were practical things, there were psychological things. And then, you know, I'm a designer. I like designing. I wanted to make something that, that, was, that seemed to be um, a culmination of the things that I had learned. And, and in the 1980s, Sarah, my wife and I always used to take 10 days every summer to visit gardens. And we would rent a cottage somewhere and visit as many gardens as we could in, in a different part of the country that we'd been to, which we sort of at the time thought was an obvious thing to do. Um, the fact that no one else we'd ever met did it. <laughs> didn't, I mean, we had each other, which was great. But I was obsessive about um, taking notes. You know, I would, I would look at plant combinations. I'd look at height of risers on steps. I would notice when the gardeners, what, they were, what tools they were using to prune with, when they, what the date was when they were cutting the yew hedges or whatever. I just was a sponge and just wanted to take everything in. And I read extensively and always have done so that I clearly had a need to, to just draw it in and then it came out into the garden um yeah that's that's fascinating and i i mean what i what i hear initially was a desire to control to have some yeah. control over an aspect of your life yeah. and and therefore um that was a big factor um in terms of the uh, and it's, it's amazing you visit all those gardens and I've, I must admit, and I thoroughly recommend this out there is a lockdown, watch your round the world at 80 gardens. You know, we can't travel anywhere, but going to all those fabulous places. So when you were visiting gardens and then distilling what you had seen into what you created, were there any particular classical principles or key designers that you loved and you were conscious mm. of incorporating or was it a subconscious melding of what you'd seen and learned? I think both really. I, I think it was certainly a subconscious melding uh, and I was relatively indiscriminate in so much that I sort of made it a point of, not honour, but of, the, of, in, of success that I would find something anywhere that was useful or interesting or you know, never to, to miss anything. Um, but Increasingly, you know, I love the work of Jeffrey Jellico, and, and I actually rang him once when he was in his 90s. And he very sweetly talked to me for fully an hour. You know, I was, I was writing for The Observer at the time and I, I wanted to interview him. And, and, 
I said, could I come and see you? He said, yes, well, I'm, I'm sort of down. He was still working. And he said, but of course, I know nothing about plants. I have no interest in plants whatsoever. But he was this wonderful gardener. Mm -hmm. And then he unfortunately died a week or two later, and I never got to meet him. But um, I've always been really interested in the organization of space, um, the relationship between objects, whether it be the petals of a flower, whether it's you know, the width of, 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 an ent of a gap in the uh, hedges or the way a tree is pruned, that, that, that very Japanese concept, I think it's, it's called ma, where you, that every space has a significance, whether it be between two branches or two words or two notes of music that is equal to the objects that create the space. And from a very early age, I was interested in that. And so, the spatial elements of gardens have always interested me hugely, um, more than the botanic elements, really. I mean, I, I love plants, and, and you know, inevitably you get to know a bit about them if you spend most of your life working with them. But it's it's never the pursuit of the rare and the unusual; it's the pursuit of the beautiful, and the trying to make it work by whatever definition that is. And it could be very simple. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I often said, because I, it's worth reading, is that it's really possible to have an ugly, boring garden made out of extraordinary plants and a fascinating <laughs> garden that is beautiful made out of very ordinary plants. Uh, it's what you do with it. You know, gardens are made by people, not by plants. People and plants working together. Uh, I think it was Church who said that, you know, gardens are for people. And I, when I was doing that round the world thing, and I've done lots of other trips since, I've been incredibly lucky with the BBC to go all over the world and do lots of things. I asked everybody what their definition of a garden was. And when I started it out, I wanted to, to me, it was a sort of cultural thing. I wanted to know what someone in Argentina thought a garden was and, uh, and someone in India, whatever. And the best answer I think I had was from a man called Juan Grimm in uh, Chile. And he said that when a tree falls in the forest, it creates a glade. But when somebody cuts a tree down and creates a circle in the forest, it creates a garden. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's very aptly puts this, it, the, that element of control that may have broadly the same effect as a natural thing, but it's not natural. Gardens are not natural. Which, which then comes on to the whole interesting thing about wildlife and, and the whole style of natural garden, make it look natural. We have a farm in the Black Mountains that I've been nurturing for the last 15, 16 years uh, in a very different way to what I'm doing here, um, trying to make it look as though I've done nothing. And I've done a lot of work to make it look as though I've done nothing. Uh, um, and that's you know, clearing, just, just working with the trees and the landscape and we we planted very little but just just but just this idea of I mean, a totally different way of working with that i did those years ago um which i find absolutely as fascinating and as interesting i was tempted to ask you quickly about start off on the thing about rewilding there but maybe we should do that well no rewilding i mean I, i'd love to talk about rewilding because i think it's it's incredibly interesting um yeah. I have a son who, who runs a farm who's become completely passionate about rewilding. I mean, that generation of mid-30s, I, I view it with some skepticism, I have to say, because it seems to me that unless you have X thousand hectares and another source of income, it's, it's really hard to, to, to rewild on, on a small scale um, it's almost impossible to rewild and make a living as a farmer, <clears throat> uh, which God knows is hard enough, uh, you know, if you're, particularly if you're a hill farmer or anything like that. And yet, clearly the impulse is really interesting and informative. So it's something that we are actively dealing with on a day-to-day -day level on the farmers of how can we regenerate and encourage us. I mean, our brief that we've given ourselves is to encourage, make a 
a landscape that has the best possible habitats to get as broad a range and as diverse a wildlife as possible. That's and yet... That, that, that's, I think, the issue, isn't it? It's about, I think the word rewilding has slightly thrown people, you know, the definition, yeah. because re it sounds like we're going back in time. Yeah. And wild yeah. means like getting rid of every human yeah. presence, whereas it's not really that. It's about, no. I, think it, I think it means increasing biodiversity, improving the yeah. ecology. I think rewilding is an unfortunate word. I think, I think it's, it, it's, it was brilliant. And, you know, the, <laughs> it caught people's imaginations, which is great, because it gets them thinking along those lines. But you're right. It's this sense that there was this sort of state, this this Eden that existed before we came and ruined it. And all we have to do is let things go and get back to it, and everything will be fine. And actually, the we can't go put the genie back in the bottle. We have to live with nature, and that means, and and it's you know it's complicated. For example, in the Black Mountains where we are it's almost impossible to grow any kind of crop other than grass. Um, so therefore any, any agriculture has to involve grazing of some sort. Uh, and so the big issue for us is how you manage your grass and your grazing. Um, and also tree planting is, is people think desperate, they go out and they plant a thousand trees of the same species and pat themselves on the back and you've got a monoculture. Mm. Um, and I think that, I think this is a process and I don't feel critical of it. I just think that we are working a way of, of making this happen. But my, my biggest worry about the whole rewilding thing is, it's again, it goes back actually to this initial part of this discussion. It's something that's happening out there by other people, almost as a kind of punitive thing that, Farmers should be rewilding instead of growing this terrible, these crops, you know, that, that are not doing any good. And that if only they would just let it go and plant lots of trees, we'd all be happy and nature would be happy. And that, that just isn't going to work. It has to be brought back to the particular and the small and the garden and, and this sense of allowing nature in rather than booting man out. Um, but I don't have any easy answers on that. I don't think it's easy at all. Do you think the garden can, because it isn't, as you say, it's not simple because, because ecology is incredibly complicated. It is mm. a tangled web and you pluck mm. one string and it creates all sorts exactly. of perturbations as well. And that's why I think th th some of the sort of very well-meaning well uh, exercises just haven't worked because they, mm. they don't understand. But do you, well, I suppose my point really is, do you think that the garden and being in the garden and learning the principles of how you create a sustainable or a more, a more viable ecology or biodiverse ecology in a garden is something that we don't do enough of. We tend to be a bit too over-managed in gardens or? I, th I think the, the simple answer is yes. We have historically been far too over-managed and, and you know, the, there is a very well-documented and we could have a very long and learned conversation about how garden, how garden management has evolved, uh, particularly in, the, in Britain. Um, and there are lots of social reasons for that, as well as horticultural ones. But we are moving out of that. I mean, I think there is a broad awareness now uh, that the natural world is by and large beneficial and by, to the gardener and, and their idea of what a good, you know, a good, and I realize these are, these are very loaded terms, garden might be. Um, the danger is at, at, at every level, is that there's a sort of a standard by which people measure themselves um, and whether they watch this garden on telly or they go to Chelsea or they sort of look at a wonderful wild garden. In, in, and I think that the crucial thing is, is that there is room for every garden to work out their own balance that includes the gardener and their life as well as the wildlife. And you do what you can, and I and the message that I always try to is is just that is balance. Get a garden to balance itself. Think of it holistically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been very involved in the soil association and, and the whole organic movement in this country, and and one of the messages that, that is quite hard to get across to people is that organic is is something that is completely integrated. It's not just about your health. It's not about 
taste your food. It's not about more purity. It's connected. It's interconnected with everything. And that what, what you have to get across to people is, is exactly your point. To understand that you are a butterfly wing and every time you flap something, that, that will have an effect. And you can't control all those effects, but you should try and understand what you can control. So we get people, I mean, I, I would say, just get some water into a garden, get a pond, have, have some nettles, have a, have a sort of area of long grass you don't cut, get cover of, of all kinds, keep seeds, don't cut everything back. Um, don't, you know, don't, bare soil is, is unlikely to be a rich habitat. Um, and just on that level, that gets people going and gets them on, into the rhythm. I think it all goes back to this first question that, that if we can make people realize that their relationship with the natural world is as rich and important in their back garden as it is anywhere on this planet, then that connection, that web, will stretch right out across the planet. And do you think that includes, because you mentioned about good, because I mean, yeah. one of the things I I've struggled with or have to deal with in my own work is good animals, bad animals, yeah. you know, yeah. fox bad, poor little yeah. chicks that are, it's going to be good. Yeah. And the same in the garden, you know, I know, I know that you've, um, you've, you've talked about bees and wasps and, and yeah. I, you know, that's to me as a, I'm a, I'm a fan of entomology and I think right. uh, poor old wasps actually, yeah. but, so is that is that a, something we need to embrace? Is, do we need better education, or how can we? How can we? We need to educate. I mean, we, we certainly need to embrace. I mean, I, I suspect that that we all would share the same world view on that. That it's something we all struggle with. But but you know, this idea of hierarchy of, of good and bad animals is is entirely um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't. I think we've got a long way to go on that. I think you know. For, for example, the language you use is terribly important. Um, I always feel uncomfortable when people talk, well, first of all, I hate pests and disease, which is this sort of, this branch of horticulture immediately labels all kinds of things in a sort of very tight, rather uncreative area. The, the word bug has, implies that it's going to do harm rather than good. Um, the, the, even on a level is everybody loves a honeybee, but they're rather, they don't realize that, that there are lots of other bees that, 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 that also are just as interesting, just as important in their own way. Um, a wasp is a very good example. Today I was watching a rat eat the bird food I've put out. And, and I was thinking, God, I wish I had a gun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then, but actually <laughs> watching the rat, it was actually rather a handsome rat, you know. Um, but I keep chickens and, and we don't want rats and chickens. And so, you know, it, it, of course, all this complexity. Um, and th the whole web, I mean, the, the very, very simple idea of the food chain is something that we you never let up. I mean, I think one if we can get that across to people. Um, I don't, I think there's a, still quite a lot of, of ignorance where people simply just don't know. And whether that's because it's not coming through enough at a school level or because we're not absorbing it, I don't know. But there's a, histori there's a history of it though, isn't there? There's a history of that being being effectively anti-educated that bad, bad things are bad. So I yeah. think that's, that's an yeah. even harder job. I mean, I would love to see, you know, it'd be great if we had incredibly beautifully shot programs about slugs and rats and uh -huh. uh, yeah. I mean, but you see, I mean, in gardening terms, 99% of, of anybody out there is going to see a slug or a snail as not just bad, but actually a personal enemy. You know, this, this is one who's got it in for me in my garden and, and uh, that, that actually exists to harm me. Um, and it's, it's a thing that one has to keep repeating that this is all part of, of the whole chain. And I'm just, um, that's all, that's fascinating. I'm just thinking about um, creating uh, understanding and connectedness and thinking about an urban setting. So we're, for those of us lucky enough to have back gardens, um, obviously lockdown has made everybody very conscious of those people who don't have the immediacy of 
the natural world right around them. And um, really combining that with the lack of education in schools, you know, plant sciences as a whole, or, you know, the whole well, natural history and observation, all those things that we've touched on today. So if people care about things they know and have engaged with, um, and this really is a sort of question for architects, town planning, all sorts of areas as well. How can we bring nature back into the lives of people who don't have the gardens? And I, I loved one of your um, Italian Mediterranean gardens in Cordoba in Spain. Patio where, gardens, yeah. Patio gardens, yeah. exactly. So, Yes, what can we do? Well, can we do the, the patio gardens are a good example because actually that's an attitude rather than, than a physical presence. You know, this idea that you, you celebrate plants and beauty in a situation that is, is sort of apparently devoid of any garden. Um, it's tricky. I mean, we, you, we, I would just qualify this, but the latest figures were that 87% of British people have access to a garden. So although that means that millions don't, and that's very important, the overwhelming majority do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's still a good number and, and one should bear that, that in mind. I think that, you, you know, we, I, I remember doing a program um, about the history of gardening and, and, and studying the whole element of new towns uh, after the war, both wars and, and planning. And there was this, incredible moment when, when new towns were where people had gardens. And I went and interviewed some people who had moved from the wartime London to new towns. And the luxury of having a garden, I mean, that incredible sense, rather like we had when we went to Cambridge, that's how they felt about their garden. Every day they walk outside the back door and think, this is our garden. And it, and it, and it was so appreciated and, and used at every level. And I think people feel the same about allotments too. I mean, the first step I would make is, is just make more allotments. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of allotments. Mm -hmm. And I think that because they can, you know, they have a really good way of, of crossing all social boundaries and, and race and class and all the rest of all that nonsense. Um, they're just accessible and they have a very clear function. Uh, they, they relate people to food, they relate people to seasons, they relate people to the thing you were talking about earlier of getting your hands on the soil and sowing seed and all this. Uh, and they don't come with the clutter of expectation that gardens have, this idea of, of what is good and, and doing it correctly and, and being watched and measured. There is a, a certain liberty about an allotment. So that's the first thing. I'd have definitely more allotments. And I think the idea of communal gardens in some form is really difficult. And it's, 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 I don't think anyone's really cracked it. Um, we were talking about Jellicoe earlier. He did a really good garden along the river in, oh God, Harlow Newtown, is it? Um, I think it could be. Um, which was, works very well because it's the best way to get to the shops from the bus station. <laughs> so people just, you saw people walk a store, walking up and down with their bags, going to and fro. Um, I think when you designate gardens, there's a great danger that either people feel a bit intimidated by them, or they despoil, vandalize them, or a small group of people take ownership. And it may be with the best of intentions to look after it, but it's quite difficult to get a, a communal garden to be truly communal and truly for the community. And, and I think maybe it's a better plan to think of streets and areas to, to garden streets. And, and um, I'm thinking in what's that area in Paris up in, um, in the business area um, where they have amazing landscaping and gardens done, but they're, they're just sort of where people walk around by offices and streets rather than places that are designated as gardens. Um, parks are wonderful things. I mean, the whole Victorian park movement, incredible thing. And, and I think still, in many ways, that's more accessible than actual gardens. But of course, what it means is that people don't get that hands-on thing. But, and I realize I'm talking too much, so stop me, but um, <laughs> is that, 
The key to gardening is an element of ownership. It's really hard to garden somewhere you're renting uh, or you've only got a lease on for six months or something. When you garden, part of the power of it is investing in a future. Mm. And, and I think that, you know, you talk to anybody, one of the things I've been very moved by over the last year or two is people who, who've been bereaved in, in some way, that what's helped them through is this idea of you plant a seed, you sow a seed or you put a plant and next spring will come, it will flower, there will be fruit. And we all know this thing of, of planting a tree, you know, plant is that you plant an oak and you plant it for many, many generations to come. And that's very empowering. And, and, and so I think that's one of the problems of gardening is you need to, to invest in a future that is both yours and an unknown future for other people. Um, and that's quite hard to do on a sort of mass housing urban scale. I don't, I don't see any clear answers to that. We were, we, funny if we were, Tony and I were talking about this beforehand, about this idea of cathedral thinking, you know, that yeah. from those stonemasons who were built a cathedral. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course that was also, and you've already touched it about the, the either the planners or the philanthropists, whoever they were, who in the Victorian times would plant all these trees with the knowledge they would never sit under it with yeah. in the, in the shade. But do you, and, but that, and uh, when you were talking about Longmeadow, about being very much about the, the the, the shape of it, the space, mm. but have you also been thinking of it in very much in the other dimension of time, that actually, is it that the sense that actually this is an investment that is going to be a long-term investment, the value of that, and do you think about things that are going to exist and benefit beyond your own, your own time on the... On yeah, I mean, all, all that, all of that. <laughs> um, I think there is, when you first plant a garden, um, for the first three or four years, it's entirely an expression of hope. I mean, there is no evidence on the ground whatsoever for, for the things that you're doing. But uh, suddenly after about five to seven years, it starts to appear. This thing that, you know, the hedges and then the trees and the, start to become hedges and trees as opposed to young plants that will be those things. And after about 12 years, you can fool most of the people most of the time about how old it is. I mean, it, it, it's, and what I've found is that, because we're now in our 27th year here, is we are now radically undoing some of the things we did. We overplanted. Um, you know, I said I wanted to make little microclimates. Well, actually we've, because of climate change, we're getting all kinds of fungal problems that we didn't have 25 years ago. You know, we're not, we're not getting enough cold weather. We're not, uh, there's not, so we need more airflow. Uh, trees, and what was really interesting to me was that there was a clear tipping point of almost a, a season when, a, when trees would be fine and they would be coming into what I wanted them to be. And, and those, you know, everything I planted here, I could lift with one hand. There was no, there were no big plants at all. They were all small. And they're, they're, then they got big enough to, for the children to climb and then they got you know really big and all the rest of it and suddenly they're blocking the light they're blocking the wind they're blocking the airflow and they become in a kind of way a problem i mean it, it may be that we prefer the trees so we change the thing that's being affected by them um so that's been really interested as a, as a temporal fact that that i hadn't planned for at all i hadn't really you know, I was a young man when I started to make this car. And uh, I hadn't thought 30 years ahead. So that, that's been great. And I've also got trees. Um, we went to a wedding in 1996 of friends of mine. And both of them went to Cambridge. And they gave all the guests a tree, an oak tree to plant. And I bagged another one. So I got two. So we've, we've always called those trees Peter and Becky. And they've grown very differently, which is <laughs> very interesting. But they've become, you know, one is really tall and big and has shot up, and the other has got much more squat and spreading around. But they've become real characters in the garden. And, and you know, they hopefully they will remain characters for the next 400 years quite happily. Um, but so I haven't really planned on that, you know, the, this idea that you become familiar, they become old friends. 
And do, do the characters of those trees reflect the characters of... Well, I like to, uh, yes, but, but of course, you know, what I'm doing is, is working after the event. So the one that now seems most like the husband has become the husband. But of course, I'm sure if it had been the other way around, it would have changed. And just, um, you mentioned a little while ago, you mentioned the word Chelsea um, yeah. came out, um, out. And um, I think probably for everybody's sake, we couldn't leave today without musing a little on what Chelsea in September is going to be like. Gosh, who knows? Well, I can tell you what it's going to be. It's a little bombshell that's been dropped into my diary. Because that's because I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be filming in the Adriatic and, and Venetian gardens and the Veneto and, and the whole Venetian I'm supposed to be doing a series about gardens of the Venetian Republic, um, which is sort of being postponed and postponed and postponed. And and I was going to do a series and it's still on, you know, it's been commissioned, going from the the north of Norway right the way down to a garden that I've been making in Greece for over the last five, six years. Uh, not mine, but for a friend, and I've been going four or five times a year and, and making it, and just tracing this European guns. Uh, so Chelsea in September, we were due to have a filming trip. So that's, that's interesting. But I think much more pertinently, my immediate thought is all those poor people who've grown their plants and raised them for May, you know, that's not gonna be any good. I think to look at it positively, it could be a really good thing because, you know, Chelsea is, this great event, this wonderful occasion that we all genuinely love, but there are lots of things wrong with it. You know, there's lots to criticize about Chelsea. And I don't know anybody who, who works with it and has to deal with it who wouldn't agree with that. But at the same time, nobody wants to throw the baby out with the bathwood. All the magic of Chelsea that none of us would, would trade is at the moment really entwined with, with some of the problems of, of space and the management and, and all that kind of thing. And I think that by being forced to move to September, there'll be a gear change, a sort of a bit of lateral thinking that would not otherwise have happened. There'll be a whole new vocabulary of plants. Um, I think the time scale means that there will be more gardens that, that are done with less money, um, on a shorter time scale, uh, it's, it means that the mood will be one of thankfulness and celebration rather than a social occasion. I, I've been hoping, you know, I hope that's the case. And I think that if we can all learn how we've adapted to that and then apply it to, to Chelsea in May, Chelsea in May will be all the better for it, you know. And, and so, I was thinking about this today because uh, about it, and I've been I've been in communication with the RHS about it to a degree, and uh, I think it's an opportunity. I think it's I think it's an opportunity to 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 expand Chelsea, to to revise it, update it, without losing anything, because nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to get rid of Chelsea. You know, it, it's it's keep the magic, but just make it work a bit better. Great. We've got, really got time for two very quick questions, okay. one each. So my last question is a television one, because that right. is, which is uh, as a director working with presenters, yeah. so uh, and you as a creative individual. Uh, so how much do you how much do you uh, desire uh, take involved in the in the making of God, but are you a mere pawn in the hands of the director? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the <laughs> I like working in, and as a writer I'm completely solitary and that's what I spend most of my time doing and one of the things I love about television and by the way I do love television I love doing it is that I'm a part of a team so that when things go well and, and for the last 10 years or so my non-Gardener's World stuff I've done with the same team the same crew same director same producer we, we, we enter these projects and we only do them if we can all do them together um, and you, you pool your resources at every level from, from how we're gonna shoot something to, and at that point, you know, the cameraman might, might control the discussion. Um, no one ever tells me what to say because I wouldn't do it anyway, uh, <laughs> but we will talk about what we're trying to get across. You know, I might say to the director, right, what are we trying to say here? What's the point we're trying to do? And then I will work out how to do that. Um, we, in terms of Gardener's World, um, I mean, I had a meeting today uh, about the first few programs. 
we shape it together. I mean, we, we try and, and build into the editorial enough to cover it. It's a magazine program after all. But the great luxury is that we have lots of VT yeah, we can go to so that what I either can't do or don't want to do or are not interested, we can get someone else to do. So that's a huge luxury. It means that basically everything I, we, I do is something I want to do anyway. Um, sometimes I have to sell it to the team. Sometimes they have to twist my arm a bit to do it, but nobody ever makes me do anything I really don't want to do. And by and large, no one's ever stopped me doing something I do want to do. So it's, I'm incredibly privileged. I mean, I, it absolutely, when television works well, it's a complete joy to do. And I think it comes across. I think you see it in the in the watching the shows actually. So that's I think that's I'm I'm, so, I'm that's what I expected you to say because I think yeah. you absolutely as a, as somebody who does it, I can see it yeah. in the show. So yeah. they, they're great. And, and I mean, what you will appreciate is what I really like working with is the immediate crew, director, cameraman, sound recorders, um, particularly when we're on the road. I mean, there is this sense of a band of brothers. I really like yes. that. Um, and, and it's exciting. And when we're traveling, you know, you, you, you're, you're living it. From the minute you get up, you have breakfast together to the minute you sort of go to bed, you talk about nothing else. You're completely immersed in it. Um, and the, the intensity of that, which I mean, I've never had to sustain for more than three weeks and that's quite long enough really, but it's very rich. It's really rich fare and what a privilege. Well, you, as, as Mike says, we can, the viewer, we the viewer can tell that you enjoy it, which um, is, comes over so well. I get the privilege of a final question and mm. it's um, in Desert Island Discs um, format. So if you're going onto the island, you can take one garden. It can't be like you can't take your family on Desert Island Discs as your luxury. You can't take any of your gardens. What one garden would you take? Gosh, 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 gosh. Um, a big island. <laughs> yes. <we're, laughs> um, Not Madagascar, but you know. It'd be very <laughs> tempting to take Ninfa. Mm, and um, why? why is that? Because it's, you know, it's this, in, this incredible romantic story, this, this abandoned town that has become a garden. Um, but there was a garden I saw um, in America last year, last year, year before last, called Federal Twist, which is quite small, but I loved it. I loved the planting. I mean, it was a plantsman's garden, but for once, the plants entranced me rather than the design or the layout. I, I loved that garden. Um, I'd be very happy to take Nympho with me on a desert island. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful answer. And I think it'll give us, you know, all of us can now go and look at those gardens and decide for ourselves, which would be our favorite garden. So um, thank, you. thank you, thank you. So thank, thank you. We, we, I think we both have had a great time. I hope, that, I hope our friends and colleagues out there watching have enjoyed it as well. Uh, thanks, so thank you so much, Monty. But I think Ian wants to come and join us to, for then to just um, say thank you on behalf of the, the society. But thanks, Indeed. For, thanks, thanks from us too. Indeed, Mike, thank you. Uh, and as president of the Cambridge University Land Society, can I, on behalf of all those attending, Monty, thank you uh, for this webinar, for such an interesting, entertaining and informative discussion, and also the personal perspective and insight you gave. Uh, what really resonated with me was this, this idea of the connectivity of our lives with the planet and how well-being is, is much a part of that. So that's the message I've very much taken from it. Today wouldn't have been possible without uh, the help of Nigel Clough, who is online, who helped us connect the dots today. And uh, you talked about the physicality in the garden and uh, I understand you and Nigel were both very physical when at Maudlin because you were instrumental in uh, Maudlin's rugby team. So that's obviously where you've got the physical element of. So, Thank you to Nigel for uh, helping us get today together. Uh, to Mike and Tanya, fantastic for guiding us through today in such an expert manner. And as always to Ali for organizing the entire event in your normal superb fashion. Um, Coles has endeavored to remain visible and current throughout these challenging times. And although our events recently have been, and I, I'm afraid for the foreseeable future, 
will remain virtual. We've successfully engaged with our almost 1,000 members and the broader student body throughout, and we intend to continue to do so. I just want to take the opportunity to reiterate to the current students that are online, or any of you who have some connections with current students, that the society is there to help them, both in terms of networking, career advice, but also in a modest fashion, let me emphasize, are offering financial support for dissertations and other studies. So please let us know if we can help uh, any of the students and be of assistance. Uh, we have an extensive uh, program of events planned for this year while recognizing we'll, we'll need to be flexible and all the information about those you'll found, find on the Culls website. But let me just quickly mention two forthcoming occasions uh, showing the diversity of the things that we do on the 4th of February at 7 p.m., we have a virtual wine tasting um, hosted by Simon uh, Bale of Excella Wines. Uh, and if uh, more information of that again on the website. And the next of our ESG series of uh, seminars will take place at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 16th of February. And I'm sure this is something Monty would have some views on. We're gonna focus on urban agriculture and food sovereignty as very important topics. Uh, and as I said, more details on the website. So thank you to all of you for your engagement and support. Uh, and once again, a very special thanks to Monty for providing such an enjoyable interlude to our lockdown. And we all look forward to seeing you at the, uh, I think you said revised and updated Chelsea Flower Show in September. Uh, thank you all for joining us and good evening. Thanks very much. Thank you.